Good morning. This is Victoria Beale with the Ohio LTAP Center, and we're going to go ahead and get our webinar started this morning. Um, hopefully everyone is able to see the screen there, and I just wanted to welcome you to You're Killing Me Smalls, How to Avoid Death by PowerPoint. Um, I would ask if you have questions during the webinar, I'd go ahead and put them in the question box and I will do my best to get responses to you. I am not only your host today, but also your presenter. So um, I will be doing double duty. But with that, I did want to mention also that in the handout section of the GoToWebinar box, there are two handouts for you. Um, you're welcome to download those anytime during the presentation. It's a copy of the PowerPoint presentation itself and also an outline to go along with the presentation. And you'll understand better why I've given you the outline um, as we get further into the presentation this morning. So the kid on the left side of your screen, that's the face I make when I sit down in a presentation and people start doing the things I'm going to talk about this morning. So. Hopefully you'll never see me sitting in your presentation making that face. But I have sat through a lot of presentations and unfortunately made people sit through presentations as well that I could have done a much better job, um, you know, utilizing PowerPoint as a, a tool to complement me as the presenter as opposed to making it the presentation. So we're going to talk about that this morning and, and it's my hopes that when we're finished, you get some inspiration to take away, to apply to future presentations that you need to make. So as we, oh, here we go, hopefully the technology is going to cooperate. I also think I see people sitting in presentations at times that are doing this, especially as it, it rolls on and on and the slides keep coming up on the screen. They're like, please stop, I can take no more. And you know, I think this happens when we see things on the screen that we can't read, that are so small, uh, or you know, slides that are so incredibly crowded that you can't really decipher what it is that the person was trying to communicate to you on the slide. So we're gonna talk about that. Um, and I wanna caution you, you know, when it gets down to it, you know, the reason for doing a presentation is for you to present it, not to use PowerPoint as a crutch. Um, so, you know, if you're not comfortable doing presentations and someone comes to you and asks you to do it, you know, just tell them, you know, I'm not comfortable with it. Is there somebody else who can do it? But if, if you truly have to do the presentation, please, you know, hopefully the recording is working for this webinar this morning. We're going to post it to our um, YouTube channel later today. Go back and, and watch the recording again. See what you can do to make some changes in what you're doing because you don't want your presentation when you're using PowerPoint to end up being the, the cockroach of the office. The, they said that PowerPoint can be the cockroach of the office because when it shows up in a presentation and it's used wrong, no one likes it. They actually dread it when they start seeing the things happen on the screen that we all know are we shouldn't really be doing with PowerPoint. So the other thing is I want to also caution you to stop using PowerPoint as a way to publish a book. You know, when you use PowerPoint to create an outline and you have lots of bullet points in there, and then you start reading it word for word to your audience. That's the essence of having killed them with death by PowerPoint. PowerPoint was never meant to be used that way. It was meant to enhance your presentation, to add to what you're doing and you're saying. It was never meant to be, you know, you basically reading to them from a book. If you got in the front of the room and you brought a book with you instead of the PowerPoint and you opened the book up and started reading, people would just completely turn off. And you know that. So why would you want to make your PowerPoint a book? You don't want to do that. You know, we all have to do presentations at times, you know, technical in nature, um, informational in nature. You know, we use it for teaching. But you want to make sure that when you're using the PowerPoint that, you know, you use it as a PowerPoint hero. Because I know that there's a hero inside of all of us that knows what things are in PowerPoint that make us crazy. And I want you to reflect on that as you're sitting down to write, you know, 
write or draw up or draft up your next PowerPoint presentation and, you know, pick back to this webinar that you've participated in and use it as a way to start being that PowerPoint hero. Be that person that they talk about after the conference that said, boy, I really like that presentation because it kept my interest. I took some things away that I remembered and I learned. So I want to make sure that, you know, you have these tips and tricks that you can work into your presentation. Um, so you're not penalizing the people that come to your sessions. You, you want to make it a good, fun, and possibly interactive, you know, opportunity for them. So I'm not going to pick on anybody's presentation that I sat in the room for. I actually went out to the internet and found a slide that does a lot of the same things that I see happen in presentations. And I want to use it as an example during today to be able to talk to you about this. So the first thing I want to talk about in this slide that you're seeing on the screen is that you can have too much text on a screen. And you know, when you look at this screen, there's a lot there. You, you just got to read through it or, you know, unfortunately, you might even have the presenter reading it to you. But, you know, I want to tell you sentences are out. Guys, do not put sentences on your PowerPoint slides. You know, you want keywords. Keywords are in. You know, the presenter speaks in full sentences. The PowerPoint aids by giving you keywords that go along with what the presenter is saying. So make sure that you are focusing your presentation on just keywords. And the other thing I want to mention is that there really can be too many bullets on a slide. And it distracts. It's just you know, too much clutter on the screen. So, you know, be careful to only use bullets sparingly. I know it turns itself on automatically when you're working in PowerPoint. You know, as I was building this presentation, I had to actually go through and turn it off in the, the each screen as I was working on it where I was putting keywords. But, you know, don't do page after page of bullets. You know, the this slide that I found online that we're using as an example, there is actually 11 bullets on that screen. And that's not counting the title or the link they're giving at the bottom. And that is just way too much. I can tell you if I'm the person who's sitting in the back of the room when the slide comes up, I more than likely can't even read what's on the screen. So why should I even you know, look at that or possibly look at the presenter? I've, I've gone off and I'm distracted and, and I'm thinking or of other things, you know, the person's not holding my interest. And as a presenter, we want to make sure we're holding the interest of the audience. You know, the other thing that I want to encourage you to do is look through the information in your outline, which should be separate from your PowerPoint, and see how you can visually represent the things that you have in your outline. And whenever possible, instead of keywords, do a visual representation. You know, if you look at the, this slide, I'm going to pull out the very last bullet point at the bottom. It says, put the decimal point in red ink. It helps visual perception with the dyslexic child. Well, I would say that all of us like to see things visually, you know, and we have a tendency to remember them better when we see them visually. So if I was trying to emphasize this point, I would have it in my outline to talk to people about, but I wouldn't have that listed on the screen. Instead, I could possibly have an actual representation of a, a number with a decimal point in it. And then as I'm talking about how that would be better if it had that you know, decimal point in red, then I can make it turn red in my presentation to emphasize that point. So, you know, you, you got to get somewhat creative. And if you're not the creative one in your office, sit down with, you know, your team, build some time in, sit down and talk to some people, say, hey, I've got to present on this. Can you think of ways that I could visually represent what I'm going to talk about that would emphasize that? Because I can tell you when you go away from this presentation, had it just been that last bullet on that slide, that we wanted you to remember, it would be much harder to remember by it being number 11 on the screen as opposed to you seeing it, you know, represented here in a visual manner with that red decimal point. And that brings me to the next thing. One idea per slide, please. 
This is not where we're going to have one slide per minute for the presentation. So if you have 30 minutes, you should have 30 slides. This is one idea per slide. And you know, if you have a lot of ideas, you're going to have to go quicker. But it's OK, because the visual representation is really going to help keep people engaged. And they'll be able to follow you, even, our, even if you are moving through the screens a little quicker. So you know, how do you still get across the information that you want them to take away? Give them a handout, but don't give them a handout that is the printout of your slides with a note page to, you know, notes section on the right. Do a handout that summarizes your main points. So, you know, like I mentioned before we started this PowerPoint, um, excuse me, the, the presentation, you know, I have handouts in the box. And you can download a handout to go along with the presentation that basically is going to give you the information that I'm talking about. Um, but you know, don't build a book with all of your full sentences and your bullets and then print it out in a format for them to take notes on. So, oh, good. Somebody told me they could hear me loud and clear. I just saw that the question thing was in there. Thank you. I appreciate that. I you know, never know when I'm going these things started so all right so we've talked about those items the next thing I want to talk to you about is contrast because I think that that plays tremendously into keeping the attention and really emphasizing certain things now I can tell you when I was working on this presentation that I found tools some tools in PowerPoint that were phenomenal because these apples weren't just by themselves. I actually was able to make the background of these apples disappear with a tool in PowerPoint. But you know, with contrast, it's usually the brightest thing on the screen that gets the most attention. So what I did this time is I mixed it up and I went with a black background in order to bring what I wanted to communicate into being the brightest thing on the screen. So, you know, with this screen, you see how I did that change. Um, you know, with my PowerPoint, I went ahead and set the template ahead of time to just have a black background. And then I was able to modify the one screen that you just saw that had the white with the black lettering on it. But you see how the word contrast really jumps out at you a whole lot more here than it did on the last screen. And I want to make sure that you're thinking about that. That's definitely a way to get people's attention. If you, you go online and you look at presentations that people do and you Google, you know, good PowerPoint presentations or, or things like that, these are a lot of the tips you'll find. Um, you know, one person that kept coming up over and over again in the research that I did in preparing for this was Steve Jobs. And this was a, a technique that he used in his presentations. And I do have some links on the bottom of my outline if you want to do even some more research, some of the, the better ones I found that talked about ways to improve your PowerPoint presentations. But with contrast, I also want to caution you to not make it too much. I did not create this screen. I went out and found it. But I've probably in my you know, career made screens like this. So don't go with too much on the screen. You know, here there's just way too many colors and the contrast. It hurts my eyes to look at this screen. I think we've all seen screens like that where, you know, people thought that they were using the right color combinations, but it just didn't work. And, and if you ever had that happen to you or you have it happen to you repeatedly, get the opinion of somebody else in the office after you build the presentation. Say, hey, will you look at this for me and tell me if you think my color coordination is good on this or not? But, you know, just try to pick a color scheme and, you know, stick with those three or four colors in your color scheme. And that'll help keep your whole presentation tied together. You know, you want to make sure that um, you're able to keep people engaged and not turn them off by clutter. And clutter sometimes can be the, you know, utilization of too many colors in what you're trying to present. So you want to keep them focused. You want to leverage your contrast. Um, you know, a technique you saw me use earlier was graying out a previous term as I was moving into the next terms that I was introducing on the screen. Here you're seeing me use the 
um, leveraging of the contrast with the red versus the white to emphasize, you know, that that's what we're talking about right then, you know, streamlining the color scheme just turned red, but you want to keep them focused on what it is you're talking about, you know, keywords, keep them focused, leverage the contrast. And going back to our slide that we've been using as an example, you know, another thing is that the thing that's the biggest on the screen, like you'll notice on this screen here that where I was talking just previously, as I worked through those terms, it just got a little bit bigger each time, didn't it? As I, I clicked on the term that and it turned red, you know, really the biggest thing on your screen should be the most important thing you're trying to communicate. I would guess that the person that created this slide on suggestions for teaching math really could have cared less if they remembered the title of this slide. What they really wanted the people to remember was these 11 bullet points they put on here. So, you know, what I want you to do is make sure that as you're putting one idea per slide, that you make sure that the thing that you're trying to emphasize the most has the largest font size. So font size does matter. The other thing that matters is readability. That's another reason for going with a large size font. I don't want to ever be in a presentation where I've given people text that's so small that the person in the back of the room can't read my PowerPoint. And for those of you who I've killed with PowerPoint before, I'm sorry, but know that I'm going to be trying to make sure that I do these techniques and tips myself as I present from here forward. The other thing you want to do is try to stay away from heavily stylized fonts. You want to make the font as easy to read as possible, so keep it simple. In my research, they said that the sans serif family of fonts is, is the family of fonts that are the easiest to read. And to, you know, that would be a, um, a good way to try to stick with those types of fonts to make it easy to read on your screen. You know, another thing is don't use random sized letters in words unless you're writing a ransom note. So this randomization of letters in words it, it just really distracts from what you're trying to communicate. So you want to make it simple to read, large size. Um, other thing is don't make it all caps. All caps, believe it or not, is the equivalent of yelling at somebody. And you don't want your whole presentation to be that you were yelling at the audience. So, you know, I know sometimes folks aren't as good at typing as others. You know, just take the time though and do the proper capitalization um, and make sure that you've got that on your screen. If you're using keywords, you're not gonna have as much to type in anyway. And another point is unless you have won the Scripps National Spelling Bee, like these eight youngsters did in recent years, please, please, please spell check your presentation. And when I mean spell check, don't rely on the spell checking in the program to do it. I had an embarrassing email I sent two weeks ago where I relied on spell check communicating that our township sign grant application was now available. And we said in the, I said in the email that they didn't need to attend the pre-grant meeting, but I misspelled pre-grant, spell check fixed it for me. And it's then when the message went out, it said that they did not need to attend the pregnant meeting. You know, spell check, doesn't really know what you're trying to communicate. You do though, so make sure, even if you do spell check it, that you read it through for grammar, for proper words, because spell check will just change things. And if you hit send, you know, you're basically taking a chance that you had something go out that you never meant to communicate. So I had a couple colleagues that emailed me wanting to know about this pregnant meeting and it was embarrassing and I apologize. But again, it, it brought back to me the fact that I can't rely on the spell check that's built into the Microsoft programs. So you've got those tips down. Let's talk about charts and graphs next. Please don't put a ton of information on one slide. You know, you want to make sure that on your slides, 
you're keeping things easy to read, and you wanna limit the number of items on the slide. I got this slide off the internet too. I'm not picking on anybody in particular um, whose presentation I sat in, but you know, it's a lot going on on this slide. If I was sitting in the presentation, I would have a hard time trying to really figure out what was the focus or what was the point of what they were trying to communicate. What's the one main idea from this slide that they wanted me to know? So there's a rule that was consistently mentioned as I was researching for this, and it was less than or six items on a slide at most. So if you can get it down to just you know one idea, one thought, and then represent that with six or less keywords or items, then that seems to be the, the key that communicates the best to the audience. And while you're looking for the way to represent the idea, please don't make any of those six items an annoying animation. I know I see these things pop up less and less in presentations, which I'm grateful for, but I still see them pop up every once in a while. And what you wanna make sure of is that you don't have Mr. Turkey here popping out of the pumpkin or whatever other little cutesy animation that is drawing the attention away from your audience. Because there's, kind of, there's actually a hierarchy of what keeps people's attention when you're using the PowerPoint to enhance your presentation. And the first thing that they'll, or I'll be drawn to on the screen is something that's moving. So Mr. Turkey could, be moving on the screen and they'll never remember what it was you said or the main point of the slide because there was a moving item on there and that's where their attention went. The next item that will get their attention is what is called a signaling color. And being the industry we're in, we know what these are, red and yellow. You know, the, those are those colors that grab the people's eyes on the signal and Believe it or not, in the presentations, it grabs their eyes too. So you want to make sure that you know if you're you have something that is really your main idea, your main point. If you want to try to grab their attention in this hierarchy, use a, a signaling color for that text. The next thing that'll get their attention is high contrast. You see how when that box popped onto the screen, the yellow has a higher contrast than the other ones, and it really draw, drew your attention or drew your eye down to the bottom left. And then last but not least, larger in size. So again, the most important idea on the screen that you're trying to communicate should be the largest size font. You've got all that, and that's great. The next thing I would like to talk to you about are acronyms. And I got to tell you, back when people first started texting and using acronyms and texting, I had to actually go out and Google what they meant. And that kind of brought home to me, even then, the fact that unless I know ahead of time, you know, what the acronym means, it makes it much harder when I'm sitting in a presentation. And I'm sure you've been in presentations where people basically were talking in code. They had all of these different acronyms, you know, that they were using. Even, you know, our LTAP Center, LTAP is an acronym for Local Technical Assistance Program. But when you're in a presentation, try to spell out what the acronym is the first time and then give the acronym. But also try to make sure you're not speaking in acronym ease, where it's just acronym after acronym after acronym. Because if you do, especially folks who aren't as familiar with the acronyms are going to be looking just like this lady on the screen, and you're going to lose them. It's just going to be way too much. Going back to charts and graphs, another thing that wanted to discuss today in this Death by PowerPoint presentation is please don't put too many charts and graphs on a screen. It is just, even though there's six charts on here, it's still way too much. When you're getting down to charts and graphs, you really need to keep it limited down, you know, to, to one per screen. And the other thing is to please make sure that when you put them on the screen that they're readable from the back of the room. Now I picked this one and I'm not endorsing any website that I've picked these off of, but I thought the MBA excitement chart was appropriate as we're moving into March Madness. But if I was in the back of the room, or probably even the front 
row of the room where this presentation was being given, there's a very good chance that I would never be able to read what all these little items are all around this giant chart. So make sure that the information on your chart is readable from the back of the room. Another thing is use charts that people are familiar with. I'll be sitting in presentations at times and I really think sometimes it, it's the person trying to prove how many different charts and graphs they know how to use because I see them come up with charts and graphs I've never seen before in my life. Like this one, I, I when I was doing the research, I, I've never seen a chart like this before. But believe it or not, this one's all about swimming and how many laps people swim and how fast they swim their laps. And, you know, the, the thing is, is on this chart, you know, if no one has experienced this other than the presenter in the room, you're going to lose people because there's a lot of information on the screen and they really need time to digest it. So try to stick with charts and graphs that generally your audience will be familiar with and will have seen before. And also do me a favor and please don't use laser pointers when you get one a, a chart or a graph up there. I'm going to show you here in a second a way to eliminate the use for a laser pointer. So here's an example of a chart that hopefully if I was talking to an audience about the trainings that have been offered through our LTAP Center that most people would be comfortable with, that they could easily digest the information. And, you know, if I wanted, say, to emphasize of this chart, the fact that, you know, the green stood for the live webinars we offer and that that had been 11% of the total trainings we offered last year, then I could use a call out to emphasize that information. So instead of using a laser pointer to point down to live webinars and circling it with the little red and saying, oh, look here, this green, it matches the green on the chart, I used the clipping tool that comes with every computer system that you know, has windows on it now. And I clipped a little piece of the chart out and then I put it back on top and then I gave it some added emphasis with those lines to show where it was coming up from. But that's a way to be able to communicate the information. And you see when I made it pop out like that through a call out, I made it larger size, which again emphasized the fact that that's what I wanted to draw their attention to. So these are all great ways to be able to um, put information into your presentations. And, you know, one of the things that is aspirational in nature after you've worked through these pieces is to see if there's a way you can get people involved in the presentation because people truly learn by doing. So if there's a way, and this can't work with every presentation, and I know that, but if there's a way to get people up out of their seats and let them practice or do an activity that engages them in what you're trying to communicate, that's really the best way to do it. So you know, what you want to do is think about that. And if there is a way to do it, work it into your presentation. I had a um, actually a, an online meeting with a committee of people that I work with for TRB for a committee that I had up there and we were having, you know, an overview of what was going on for this coming year and then we wanted to get people's feedback. We wanted to keep them involved and keep them active in the conversation. So we used Mentimeter, which again, I'm not endorsing any one software or anything like that, but that just happens to be the tool that we had available and we used. And we had 17 people on that call and we did Mentimeter polling, which they could do right from their smartphones and asked them questions about useful meetings of or useful components of our annual meeting. And they were able to um, give us their feedback. So if you can't get them out of their seats and get them up and moving, and get them involved in an activity, you know, possibly you could use online polling, which would at least keep them involved and active from where they're sitting in the presentation. And I do see another question has come in, so I'm going to go ahead and see if I can get that answered. Um, yes, there's a, what about incorporating branding? 
You know, I know that there's branding, especially at times offices or agencies will come up with PowerPoint backgrounds or templates. And I would encourage you to, you know, if you have to work with the, the branding that you're given, at least try to make the contents of what you're putting within that brand follow some of these tips or tricks. And, you know, that might take away from the keep it to six or less per slide or, or things like that if they've incorporated images or logos around the outside edge. But I can tell you that after the first two or three screens, if you're using the same branded background, your audience will then focus in on the content that you're using. You know, I, it can't be a perfect world. So we do what we can with what we have from where we are and we make the best of it. But I think even just using some of these tips and tricks will definitely help you out. Um, but keep in mind, to learn, students really do need to do something. And you know, don't hold all the questions to the end if you can help it. You know, if you do presentations, you know how to, you know, say I'm going to take one more question, then we got to move on. You know, or I'll get back with you, or, or let's visit about that after the presentation's finished, if it's someone that really has a lot of in-depth questions um, and you still have information you need to get through. But try to engage the students throughout the presentation, because if you don't, you're going to turn them off. And that's the last thing you want to do. You want them to be able to take information away from the presentation. And hopefully it's information they can apply to their work when they get back, because that's the most valuable thing anyone can get from the, the presentation is the immediate application of what it is that they've learned about their back into their lives, into their work. And that's the, I think, the best time spent. So we've talked about an awful lot. And I'm actually not going to keep you for a whole hour because I want you to use some time to um, definitely go through and think about ways that you can improve your presentation skills. But, um, you know, keep in mind that this is a process. And just like any process, any metamorphosis takes time. And you may not be able to use all the tools. You know, a comment that just came in was that there might be an exception to, you know, what I've talked about today and the presenting project information to the public doesn't always allow for interaction. And, and if you can't do the interaction, that's okay. These are just tools in the toolbox. Um, you know, hopefully there's other tools in the toolbox you can use to help enhance your presentation. But, you know, you can be like the caterpillar and the butterflies, which hopefully we'll be seeing more of here as spring moves in. And, you know, work on your own metamorphosis and use the tools in the toolbox that we've talked about here or others, because I did give you links on the handout to other um, videos that I found out there that talked about techniques and tips um, to be able to incrementally you know, keep your PowerPoint presentations moving in the right way and, and not kill people with death by PowerPoint. So with that, I'm happy to take any other questions you have. Here's my contact information. I made it really big font this time to make sure that everybody could see it and read it. Um, but I am happy to take any other questions you have in the chat pod. And I appreciate your time on the presentation, the webinar this today. I've tried to record it. And if that was successful, I will be publishing it out to our um, YouTube channel. And I'll be sending out a link later on, hopefully this afternoon, not only to the recording, but also to a copy of my PowerPoint presentation and the handout, the outline that goes along with it. So I'm going to give it just a few more seconds to see if anybody's typing. Oh, here we go. Got a couple more questions. Um, let's see. Using an animated item can be used to induce some humor to get people's attention following or during a more boring topic. You know, if you feel that an animation is appropriate in your presentation, then again, that's that hierarchy, that moving item. Just make sure that I would caution you just make sure not to leave it up on a screen so long that it's distracting or it becomes annoying. You know, maybe if you do want to use it, it's a, a screen that you click through and you get to that point and then you have the animation and then you move on. So you just want to make sure it doesn't end up detracting from your presentation. I've seen presentations where people have had those, you know, 
11 bullet points up and then they had the little dancing guy in the upper right hand corner and I can tell you that the people in the room were paying no attention to the 11 bullet points, but everybody was focused on how many times that little dancing guy was going to do his routine before we went to the next slide. Um, and then another question was, have you ever presented somewhere that used ProPresenter, thinking of how you structure your PowerPoint for easy conversion? No, I haven't used ProPresenter, but I will look into it. and. I will be happy to, if I find information on how you can structure PowerPoint into ProPresenter, um, definitely share that with you. I've um, heard of Prezi, which is another presentation software, and I've looked at using it, but I'm not a big fan of Prezi. Um, I feel that PowerPoint is, I feel like some of the techniques or, or things that are built into Prezi are more distracting than, um, you know, they than enhancing for a presentation. So um, I tend to stick more towards PowerPoint. So, all right, I don't see any other, oh, okay. Wide screen versus standard slide layout. I think that really depends on the, where you're gonna be presenting at and the equipment that they're gonna have for you, or if you're taking your own. I, you know, like with today's presentation, I did that in widescreen. Some people use um, templates, PowerPoint templates, and some of them can be the old standard layout. But I think you should have a conversation with wherever it is that you're going to be having the presentation and find out what they can accommodate to make sure that you're fitting what you set up to the screen that they have available there. But if it's personal preference and I can go either way, I do like the white screen because I feel like it's more of a, um, a movie type setup, which, you know, I think a lot of people are, are geared towards that with, you know, movies and television. That It just, my own personal view is that it's easier to the eye, but, you know, that's my personal view. So, all right, here we go. Any other topics? Any other questions? Not seeing any. Well, if I didn't catch your question, um, let's see. Oh, yes. How about the use of videos, maximum length? You know, I, I really feel that it depends on the length of your presentation. First off, if you're going to use a video, make sure you know how to use it because I think nothing's worse than getting to where you're going to do this presentation and you've got a video and you go to click on it and it doesn't work. You need to make sure that your video is either embedded in your PowerPoint, and right now is not the time for me to try to explain how to do that. I would say go out and Google it because there's plenty of um, videos or, or explanations out there on how to do that. But your video needs to be embedded in your PowerPoint. And you, or if you're going to be using a YouTube video that you just put the link into your PowerPoint, you need to make sure that there's internet access because I've also seen people who go to do a presentation and when they get where they're going, there's no internet access and they've got a YouTube video embedded and it, the link is never going to run. Um, as far as length, you know, you need to judge that based on, um, you know, the length of your own presentation because unless the video really is the entire focus of what I'm talking about and they should have watched the video instead of having me come to talk to them, then I don't want it to be the biggest portion of my presentation. You know, a video should be used to enhance just like any other piece um, of information or, or thing you're putting on your screen. So, you know, you need to use your own judgment as the presenter. Um, and there are ways if you say you do want to use a video that's in out on YouTube that you can, you know, clip down the length of the video or start at a certain spot and then you'll know when to stop it. You don't have to use a whole video that's out there. You can just use pieces and parts of it. So do some legwork ahead of time. This is not something I'd be figuring out the night before I've got to do the presentation. I'd be, you know, figuring that out well ahead of time um, in order to make sure I start the video at the right spot and just play the little segment or component that I want. So. All right, I don't see any other questions. So if I do miss your question, please email it to me. You've got my email address on the screen and I'll be happy to respond to it. Um, 
but thank you everyone for your time on the webinar today. And please, please go forth and take these ideas and make your presentations, you know, even better than what they've ever been. And we will all benefit from it in the end. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day.